So we are going to start with classical conditioning where we left off last time and talk about this process of acquisition. So acquisition is when you are learning to associate or pair to stimuli. So the unconditioned stimulus and the conditioned stimulus, which starts off as neutral, get multiple pairings and then you learn to associate them. The only time that it takes less than one pairing or less than several pairings is when you have something like taste aversion. So for example, if you have like a stomach flu and then you go into a specific restaurant, even if that restaurant didn't cause you to become ill, you start to associate that particular restaurant with those feelings. And when you pass by that restaurant, even if it only happens once, that particular situation, you will start to associate the restaurant with those feelings. And even when you pass by that restaurant, you'll be less inclined to eat there. And sometimes for some folks, it'll even make them nauseous. So extinction means that you stop having the unconditioned stimulus and the conditioned stimulus paired, and then the organism stops responding. So for example, if you ring the bell, beep, 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 but no food is ever presented afterward, eventually the organism will stop responding to the bell. Spontaneous recovery means that after the organism stops responding, beep, 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 because the bell does not equal food, now the organism is no longer responding, then one day the beep will go off and the organism will salivate or respond. At which point that's the spontaneous recovery because they did not get reinforcement or they did not get the unconditioned stimulus paired. All right, so stimulus discriminants discrimination versus stimulus generalization. Discrimination in this context means that you only respond to a specific or a small set of stimuli. So for example, when you hear a bell noise, beep, you only respond to beep, that's the only time you salivate. You don't salivate to boom, bop, boing, just beep. That means you have discriminated or you only respond to that very limited set of stimuli. Stimulus generalization means that you respond equally across all, stimuli, all stimuli which are similar. So for example, if you learn to dislike a spider like they used here, then you tend to dislike not just that specific spider, but all spiders in general. Habituation simply means that you um, stop responding to stimuli when they are repeated and they don't give you any new information about the environment. So John B. Watson is the father of behaviorism, and he wanted to use these principles of association and classical conditioning that we've been talking about for the last two videos to understand human emotion. And so he did a very famous experiment. I've attached a video of the experiment in the module section. That experiment is little Albert. So essentially what happened is that at the beginning of the video in the experiment, you will see them present this toddler with different like fluffy animals and toys. And he did not, he responded neutral or positive. Then Watson and Rayner, because it was both Watson and Rayner who were a part of this experiment, and Rayner's in the video as well, they basically started to pair, okay, that loud sound with an animal or a fuzzy creature. So he would go to touch an animal, boom, loud sound. After repeated pairings, little Albert, of course, would be fearful and cry even when the animal or creature was presented alone because he had begun to pair the loud noise, which we are naturally afraid, afraid of, with the creature or the fluffy animal. So put a different way, the loud noise is the unconditioned stimulus. The response to that, the unconditioned response is fear or tears. Okay, loud noise, unconditioned stimulus, unconditioned response, tears. Now we're going to take something neutral, like an animal, and we're going to pair that with the loud noise. So the loud noise is the unconditioned stimulus. The conditioned stimulus is the animal. Pair, 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 pair. Boom animal boom little animal all right now over time you start to get the conditioned response to that animal the conditioned stimulus of fear and tears and that generalized to all sorts of things like a mask and you could see that in the video all sorts of things that were fluffy not just what it was trained on that was stimulus generalization he started to respond in a very similar way across different stimuli 
Now we're gonna talk about a different type of conditioning called operant conditioning. So in this one, this type of conditioning, basic component here is that pleasant consequences desired will result in the behavior occurring more often. Unpleasant consequences will result in the behavior occurring less often. That's the basic idea. Here's some other things that I think I need to highlight and underline and put, you know, put a great big star next to. I want to make sure you remember this because this can sometimes be a little tricky for folk. Okay, so hang on to me. Positive means to add, like an addition symbol. Negative means to subtract, like a takeaway. Okay, this is not a value about good or bad. So don't think like that. This is not what we're talking about. We are talking about positive adding negative subtraction reinforcement always increases behavior punishment always decreases behavior they work best when they are working together so let's keep going so these are some things i need you to review and this basically tells you the difference between you know classical and operant and i want you to look at that so the very first designs are the skinner box because skinner is going to be the father of operant conditioning a part of behaviorism is this little box, you see the little mouse in the box, and basically he is going to use this box to control the mouse's behavior by using reinforcement and punishment and positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, all of that jazz. So let's talk about positive reinforcement and the negative reinforcement. Remember, reinforcement always increases behavior. Always, every time, okay? Every single time. Positive means you add something to the environment that is likely to increase behavior. So if you look at this little picture, a little girl is putting stickers on a sticker chart. Those things are likely to increase behavior if she, you know, she takes joy in them. But they're added to the environment. Praise, stickers, blah, blah, blah. Paychecks, all of that. Negative reinforcement is removed from the environment and it is also likely to increase behavior. So the example they use on this PowerPoint is the seatbelt noise. Once that seatbelt, you put your seatbelt on to remove that seatbelt noise. There are so many things that we do from negative reinforcement, or basically we do them to make something else stop happening. So let's say that your mom or your father, your mom or dad, like they constantly nag you about doing household chores. If they are always nagging you about doing household chores, then you may do the household chores to remove the nagging. That's negative reinforcement. Now, what is punishment? So let's talk about punishment and the two different types of punishment that there are. There is positive punishment and negative punishment. So remember, positive is always adding something to the situation. So when you add something to the situation, that is positive. So remember, we're talking about math. So it's added to decrease the likelihood of behavior. So scolding is the example they have in the PowerPoint. This would be also like spanking if, you're, if your parent spanks you to get, well, not anymore, you're grown. But if you were older or younger, your parents would spank you perhaps, or this would be like adding something, something that the person did not want to the situation. Now let's talk about negative punishment. Negative punishment is when you remove something. We're going to talk about takeaway, and that in that used to decrease the likelihood of behavior. So you take something away, you remove something so that you decrease the person engaging in the behavior. So this is if a child doesn't listen, you might punish them or take away like their toys or you might take away their phone or something. Remember positive and negative refer to adding and subtracting. Now shaping is another thing that is used in opera conditioning is basically just reinforcing small approximations. So like if you have someone and they're not doing things the way that you want, instead of just rejecting them every time they do it, you basically reinforce them as they, as they get closer and closer. So for example, if you have someone and you're trying to teach your little boy how to potty in the toilet, right? So if you want them to urinate into the toilet, which you do, okay? and they get a little bit on the seat and they're just learning, you might say, good job, you're almost in the toilet, you're really close, and then you might reinforce small approximations. The reason that shaping generally works is because it tells the person that what they're doing right, and it's usually faster than just punishing those, those responses, especially if they're close. Okay, 
So primary versus secondary reinforcers. Primary are things that you don't have to learn. So for most human beings, things like food, water, sex, sleep, and pleasure are things that you don't have to learn. Those are things that have natural value and no one has to teach you. Secondary reinforcers are not like that. We've had to learn through pairing that they are valuable. So praise, money, little kids won't care about money. If you ask a toddler what they want, they'll say like a cuddle or a candy, things that bring them pleasure, but they will not say money, okay? We have to learn to associate money with primary reinforcers. So let's talk about the different types of reinforcement. So there is continuous and partial. Continuous simply means that every time you engage in the behavior, you get reinforcement. This is pretty rare in the real world, but basically every time you do a specific behavior, you get a reinforcement for that. So a good example in the real world is like a soda machine. Every time that you put your quarter in and you press the numbers, you get a reinforcement or you get a soda. And usually continuous reinforcement is good to learn a behavior, but it's very quick to suffer from extinction because the moment you don't get that reinforcer, usually people have a big response and they will not continue to like respond. So like they'll, they'll get angry or they'll show some sort of like undesirable emotion. So for example, if you put your coins into a soda machine and nothing comes out, a lot of people will kick the machine, they'll try to tip it over because normally it works, normally they get reinforcement. And then they may never use that machine again. Partial reinforcement is how most of us are reinforced. So this means that you get reinforcement part of the time. So if you engage in the behavior three times, you might get reinforcement every third time or every fourth time. This is how most of us receive reinforcement. So your paycheck, all of those sorts of things, those will be partial reinforcement. So fixed and variable. Fixed is going to be every single time. So a certain amount of time. So it could be every two times, every three times, but you have a very certain amount of times that you need to respond and then you'll get access to reinforcement. Whereas variable means that you have to make an average amount of responses. So you as the organism are never sure when reinforcement is going to be delivered. Normally, when things are on a variable schedule, you get human beings and other organisms to respond a lot more. Like a slot machine is an example of a variable schedule. You don't really know when reinforcement will happen, so you're much more likely to respond more frequently. Interval means a certain amount of time has to pass before you're able to gain reinforcement. So in an interval schedule, you have to drive around the parking lot and un, you know a certain amount of time, and then you're able to get a spot. That could either be fixed, so it could be like, at 10 o'clock when everyone gets out of class, or it could be variable. You could be at Walmart and you could just be hoping that a spot appears, and one will eventually, but you don't know when. Ratio is after a certain number of responses, you get reinforcement. So <clears throat> if you work at a factory, or you work in a production sort of job, you have to make three items and then you get like a bonus or reinforcement. Or this is if you're playing a slot machine, you have to pull the lever, 10 to 15 times, and then you might get reinforcement. So this is all those examples I've given. Fixed interval, so a fixed amount of time. Variable interval, a variable amount of time, so you don't know how much time. Fixed ratio, this is after a certain number of responses, or variable ratio, unsure, like that's gambling, which is the example I gave earlier. And they show you the types of responding that you get. So when you have a variable ratio and a fixed ratio, what you can see is that with a variable ratio, you see a dramatic up, move up. So people are likely to respond very steadily. With a fixed ratio and a fixed interval, people often respond, dip, respond, dip, respond, dip, because they know that they can't get reinforced right afterward. And a variable, you tend to see steady responses. A variable interval, you still tend to see those steady responses. So when variable is included, the responses tend to be much more predictable because folks don't know when they'll get reinforcement. So they generally respond more. So this is something about gambling in the brain. This kind of talks about what we're talking about. You're more likely to respond if you don't know when reinforcement is available.